My guest today is uh, Robert Widmer. He successfully predicted the 2008 financial crisis in his book, America's Bubble Economy, and also the financial storm we're facing right now in his book, Aftershark. Combined, Mr. Widmer's books have sold almost 1 million copies. Welcome to Stanley's New America. Thank you for inviting me, Stanley. Could you please share more info about yourself and your achievements as an author? Well, I, I think you, you mentioned a couple of highlights that I, I'm very proud of. One, one is, yeah, sold over a million copies. But maybe more importantly, uh, I wrote the America's, America's Bubble Economy back in 2006, uh, before the financial crisis, talking about it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say they predicted it or this and that, but where's their book? I always ask, where's your book? They might have written an article. They might have said, we're worried. Well, a lot of people did. But nobody really wrote a book on it. And then afterwards wrote the aftershock that talked about the much bigger bubble that we were creating after the financial crisis that would eventually be popped. And that's sort of what we're starting to see right now. Your theory is based on uh, multi-bubbles rather than the classic economic cycles. Why? Well, because we don't really see, and I don't think anybody can really see the economy as just in cycles all the time. I and mean, let's think, face it, is the 1890s economy of the U.S. the same as the 1990s or 1850s the same as the 1950s? No, a very different economy, very different uh, technologies. Uh, and so what we see is as we're sort of evolving through these different stages of technologies and e economies, uh, in the process, sometimes it creates bubbles, as it did in the 1920s, as it did in the late 90s, as it is after the financial crisis as well. And it's usually not one bubble, but multiple bubbles interacting. And in this case, very much that. And what about the bubbles today? Well, you know, the bubbles are the ones that, you know, the, the worst ones are the one you don't see. The, the money printing bubble, uh, the massive government borrowing bubble, uh, but also the other ones we do kind of see, consumer spending bubble, uh, stock bubble, so forth. So, uh, you know, the, the core bubble is 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 the government printing and the government borrowing, but uh, others are very related to that. And when the government uh, printing bubble pops, that's when the rest of the bubbles will pop. And not that the government can't print more money, but eventually when it prints money, it'll create inflation. And at that point, the government will not be able to borrow more money once you get significant inflation, 10, 20 percent. That what, pops everything. What is the definition of uh, economic depression, and uh, do you expect one in the United States and uh, worldwide? Well, I think an easy definition is what we had in the Great Depression, which was 25% unemployment. Uh, now, I think that's a good definition, and we're about to hit something like that, probably 20 25%. Probably not for very long, so I wouldn't consider this a depression. I mean, in the depression, we had you know longer-term unemployment at high levels. However, uh, even though we're not going to go into a depression now, I think we are going to have a very serious recession. And later, when the government can no longer print money uh, without creating inflation and then hence can't borrow money and spend like mad like it is now to pump up the economy and has been doing since the financial crisis, then we'll have a depression. Inflation or uh, deflation? You know, we really haven't had much deflation. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, recently, the last 40, 50 years, uh, when, when we had deflation back in the Great Depression, that was really more because the Federal Reserve cut the money supply by 25 percent. And that's a big cut. Very different from today, where after the financial crisis, we quintupled our money supply. And that's before the COVID printing, where we were printing as much as $600 billion a week. So, again, I would say if you get deflation out of printing or quintupling your money supply or printing $600 billion a week, you should be jumping up and down out in the street saying hallelujah because we found the golden goose uh, that's going to give us enormous prosperity. If, if you can do all this uh, borrowing, why don't we borrow $10 trillion or $20 trillion to stimulate the economy this year? And, and, of course, the Fed can buy all those bonds with printed money and not create inflation. You're aware that there are some economists predicting deflation even now. Yeah, but where is it? I mean, it's sort of almost like a deflation hoax. They were predicting it after the financial crisis. You know, the idea being when the economy slows, there's going to be less demand, so you get deflation. But that's never the case uh, normally. Normally, when the economy slows, like it did in the U.S. in the 70s and 80s, we got inflation. Is Venezuela a booming economy now? They got massive inflation. So what's happening is you get almost all inflation comes in, in as the form of stagflation. When the economy is slow, 
the government tends to print more because its revenues are going down or it's trying to stimulate the economy. Oh, just like today, <laughs> you know, government's trying to stimulate the economy by borrowing a lot. So really, you only are going to get stagflation when the economy is going down. That's that's the reality. Again, was a big exception in the Great Depression where you reduce the money supply, you did get deflation, but that's definitely not the case today. And we really haven't seen deflation much at all over the last 30, 40, 50 years. You mean by the party paid with a credit card will end soon? Well, that's almost that's something everybody can understand is basically if you look at the growth in our economy since the financial crisis, almost all of it has come from government borrowing. In other words, we we've had borrowing of a trillion dollars or more in many of those years. Very few years have we had growth of a trillion dollars. If you didn't borrow that trillion bucks, uh, the government didn't borrow, uh, you would have no growth at all. And in fact, in the last 10 years, we've had no growth at all when you adjust for inflation and government borrowing. It's been zero growth. Only growth you've seen is due to that government borrowing stimulus. And clearly, that's only going to get worse over the next year or two. My impression is that not only the government is borrowing, but some other people are doing the same thing. You're right. Um, and that is, of course, contributing to the, the bubbles, the, the, the stock bubble, uh, you know, the real estate bubble, consumer spending bubble. The difference with the government, though, and its borrowing is it's sort of borrowing with absolutely no intention or plan to pay it off. And that's not entirely true with consumers or businesses. They do pay off the loans. But if we all get extended and you have a bad downturn, yeah, then all that debt that consumers and businesses have will go bad as well. But it's not as stimulative to the economy as when the government borrows, because the government never reduces its debt in any way, shape, or form. It always just keeps borrowing more, and it has no ability, zero ability, to pay it off. I mean, think about it. If last year we were to try to pay down our deficit uh, and, and actually make, I mean, pay down our debt, we'd, we'd have to cut spending by about one and a half trillion or raise taxes by about one and a half trillion. And if we did that, it would take about 40 years to pay off our debt. Not a chance in the world we're going to the government's going to be able to do anything like that. I read your book, uh, like a couple, couple editions of your book, mm -hmm. and I remember uh, you were saying something that we, we've passed the point of no return. Yes, because just what I mentioned is the problem you have is not that in theory you couldn't uh, reduce the bubbles, but you know, anytime you start to cut that borrowing in the government, it's going to hurt the economy. You know, good times or bad times. So, you know, if the economy is doing good, who wants to cut, you know, government borrowing? It's only going to hurt the economy. Certainly the you know, economy is bad. We not only don't decrease our borrowing, we increase it. So you're at the point where there's a lot of pain from even a modest reduction uh, in our debt or a deficit. Modest reduction. Again, you know, the deficit last year was a trillion dollars. Think of what it would do to our booming economy if you tried to just go to zero and not add to debt, much less pay any off. A trillion dollars? That would crush our economy and send it into recession right there. So that's why you're kind of beyond no return. Not that in theory you couldn't reduce it. It's just in reality, nobody's going to vote for a massive instant recession uh, by cutting or borrowing. Your book, uh, Aftershock, has four editions. The last one was... Uh... 2015. 2015. I was, by the way, surprised a little bit why you didn't uh, uh, write uh, the, the fifth edition for like for almost five years. Well, you know, it's funny, um, partly because over the last few years, we've actually seen a decline in, in government printing, right? Money printing actually, you know, declined. Uh, our money supply declined. And uh, so, you know, who's to worry about a big increase in government printing, right? And I always told my publishers who were bugging me to get another book out. I said, as soon as, you know, the, the, the government starts printing money again to try to boost the, the stock market and, and, uh, and the economy, that's when I'll come out with the new book. And, and until, really, until last September, uh, the government has been reducing printing. So now we're printing massively. Uh, to try to boost the economy in the stock market, so now I'm coming out with a new book, and it's called um, uh, it's called uh, Fake Money, Real Danger. Should be out this summer. Great, that's great news. I'll be the first one to to order it. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, how do you see the United States and the rest of the world after the burst of the bubbles? 
Well, uh, again, this is not just a U.S. US problem, so I, I'm glad you mentioned the rest of the world. Uh, in many ways, the rest of the world has sinned, in, well, in some ways, worse than we have. Certainly China has. Lots of, of, of massive borrowing, a lot of money printing. Uh, and, you know, countries like Japan, also a lot of debt. Uh, Europe, too. So we're going to see that the same things that happen to us happen to those other countries. And I think it's going to end up affecting them worse than us, far worse. People worry about the rise of China. But I tell you, once the, this bubble economy pops, China's not going to look so good. You know, they've, they've spent, borrowed a lot of money and spent it on infrastructure that isn't always working or used and a, a lot of growth things, a lot of growth stimulus that has worked short term, but it's going to cost them big long term. So uh, I think the U.S. will come out ahead, but it's kind of like in the Great Depression. We may have done pretty well relative to everybody else, but it still hurt. Entrepreneurs and employees, could you please give uh, three tips to each group? on how to prepare and even take advantage of the pending major economic crisis? Uh, well, first thing, remember that, that, that profits are forever, asset values aren't. Uh, so even if the value of your company or your stock falls dramatically, dollar profits is still a dollar profit in the future. Now, the, the markets may value it less, you know, like right now we're at 20 times earnings for evaluation, and maybe in the future it's two times earnings. But those are still earnings, and and you know you're you're getting them every year. So focus on making sure your costs are good, just what you would as a good entrepreneur. Keep your costs low. Always be keep an eye out for new markets. This economy will still be huge, even if it fell thirty percent. It's a huge economy. There'll be lots of opportunities to make money, um, but not many opportunities to sort of make easy money. Where oh gee, I've got a company that everybody likes, even if it doesn't make any money. It's $50 billion or, or, or $10 million. No, you're going to have to make a profit. No Teslas in the future world. you got to make a profit, and that's how you make money is you take your share of the profits, more like Henry Ford or somebody like that. He didn't make money off stock. He made money off Ford Motor because it was highly profitable, and that's what you'll be doing in the future. What is your take on the so-called uh, COVID-19 pandemic? It's interesting. Um, I, I think the most important thing that people are missing is that uh, it's it's one thing to have a COVID panic, and it is a little bit of a panic as well as a, a real thing, but I think there's certainly a lot of panic on top of the real problems. But it's one thing to have that in a regular economy, not a bubble economy. In a regular economy, I think you'd bounce back quicker. In a bubble economy, you pop the consumer spending bubble, and, and that makes it, I, I, now you're in a vicious spiral down. In a regular economy, I think it'd be more like what people are really thinking is this is sort of like a hurricane, you know, it'll pass over, blow everything down, and afterwards we'll build up and clean up. And often the economy even grows. I, I grew up in Houston, I know about hurricanes, and, and after they blow over, yeah, you actually get a lot of economic activity afterwards fixing things up. This isn't like that at all. We're in a bubble economy, and one thing you don't do is hit 20, 25% unemployment and expect it to bounce back. Is it all gloom and doom, or there is something good in store for us in the future? There's something hugely good for us in the future and hugely good out of what's happening. And that is that we're gonna be forced to, maybe not our own choice, but we're gonna be forced to focus on improving productivity as a way to improve our, our, our incomes and, and our lifestyle rather than pumping up bubbles. Pumping up bubbles, man, you know, it's, it's, it's no faster, easier way to pump up your, your lifestyle and your income uh, than to say, well, gee, I've got a company and after a year it's worth a billion, after two more years it's worth five billion, even though it's not making any money, that's wonderful. But it's not real, it won't last, and it doesn't benefit a lot of people. You know, wages have been pretty stagnant in this country uh, since about 1970. Uh, between 1950 and 1970, they doubled. That was because of productivity increases. This bubble has absolutely distracted us from productivity increases it's, it's made us focus on building bubbles because that's a fast, easy way to make money, um, but it doesn't work long term. In the long term, productivity will, will not only uh, get us a higher level of pro uh, prosperity, but far higher than bubbles ever could. Great to have you here, Bob. Thank you for inviting me.